I'd like to thank uh, the Groton Public Library for having me here again. Um, it's a real pleasure. I always love coming here. Um, it gets great crowds, very interested crowds. I'm glad you're here tonight. So thank you for coming. Um, I, I would like to start out by making sure and clarifying, actually, that for everybody here, that I am not an aviation expert. I am not an Amelia Earhart expert. I'm not even an expert on NOANC. Um, so uh, and, and I'm, I'm betting that a lot of you are from NOANC, and uh, so you can correct me as I go along. Uh, actually, wait until the end. We just have mercy on me. But um, uh, so, <laughs> so I. But so, given all that, what am I doing here? Uh, you know, telling you about Amelia Earhart's uh, wedding and knowing. Well, what I am, as Jean has mentioned, is a. Uh, I'm a freelance writer, and being a freelance writer requires uh, being a en entering into as a novice, entering into just one unintelligible, unfathomable, complicated topic or situation after another, and then subsequently passing yourself off as an expert. So this is uh, what I'm doing here tonight, talking about this, this article that I researched um, and wrote for Connecticut Magazine. And uh, what, I, what brought me to the topic, though, and another uh, facet of the writing life is being curious. I was curious. Um, I was in Noank and saw this sign here, and I began to wonder. I began to wonder, huh, really? Amelia Earhart, was she married? She was married here? Was she married in this building? And who was George Putnam? And why Noank, of all places? I mean, it's a lovely, charming spot, but it's about as far from the center of the universe as you can get, right? I mean, without some fairly rigorous stimulants. So, so all this churned up in my head. I began to ponder these things. And then being a freelance writer, of course, I began to ponder how I could make money off of the answers to these questions. So, so I did some research, and I came up with um, uh, a fascinating story that I was not the first to tell. It's been told in bits and pieces uh, elsewhere. But um, as the saying goes, uh, good writers imitate, great writers steal. So um, what I did was I just did a lot of research, read a lot of things, spoke to several people, and came up with uh, my version, if you will, uh, of this story. So uh, I, as I say, I'm, I'm here to recount the story of Amelia Earhart's marriage here in Connecticut, um, not too far away in Noank, just up the road. And uh, what, as I say, what attracted me to the story was the sign here. This sign at attached to the old Latham Chester General Store, which is now a property and exhibition space of the Noank Historical Society. So like a lot of the details of Earhart's life, uh, not the least compelling of which is, uh, are the mysterious circumstances of her disappearance over the South Pacific in 1937, uh, this sign, to me anyway, you know, raised more questions than it answered, as I said. And, and not, only, not only why in Noank, but then I also read the bottom line about NavList, um, which is a group of navigators, and I thought, well, what, is, what does this group of navigators have to do with commemorating Amelia Earhart's uh, marriage? Well, the story of Amelia Earhart's relationship with George P. Putnam, and Putnam was the grandson of the founder of Putnam Publishing. And th their relationship began not with the conventional flowers and candy and moonlight necking sessions on the porch swing, nor even aboard an aircraft. You could say that it actually began on the Staten Island Ferry in April of 1928, and Earhart wasn't even on board. Uh, Putnam was riding the ferry when he bumped into Bernd Balkin. He was a Norwegian by birth and an early Arctic aviator who'd recently co-piloted a transatlantic crossing 
in a Fokker trimotor airplane. This is Balkan here on the left and the, the airplane down here on, on, on the lower picture on the right. Um, now Putnam, who was always on the lookout for stories, learned from Balkan, he struck up a conversation with the guy, and he learned from him that the Fokker had just been sold to an English woman who was planning a dangerous long distance flight over water. Now the details were hush hush, but Balkan heard that the plane was up in Boston being fitted with pontoons for the trip. Now Putnam had a keen interest in pioneering feats of aviation because he was something of an explorer himself. He actually made a trip up around the Arctic Circle and he also had a flair for publicity and a knack for cornering the market on sensational stories. In 1927, he published the runaway bestseller We, which is Charles Lindbergh's account of his world famous nonstop transatlantic solo flight from New York to Paris uh, that same year. Now Putnam had a PR friend of his in Boston check out Balkan's story. Find out all you can, he urged his friend. Locate the plane. Pump the pilots for information. Telephone me if it's hot. Well, in a matter of hours, the PR man had the dirt on the story, which turned out to be true, kind of. Uh, the English woman was actually an American socialite by the name of Amy Phipps Guest. She was the wife of Frederick Guest, who was a member of parliament and a cousin of Winston Churchill. Inspired by Lindbergh's flight, Mrs. Guest wanted to be the first woman to fly across the Atlantic, hence her purchase of the Fokker, which had been built and modified for Richard Byrd for his Arctic and Antarctic expeditions. It was christened the Josephine Ford after the granddaughter of Byrd's sponsor, Henry Ford. And it was the first aircraft to reach the North Pole. So the plane had done some pretty rough duty and had been around and proved itself trustworthy. Now the plane had been readied for the, for the exploration of the Antarctic uh, when Ford changed his mind and wanted a plane with a Ford built engine. So he scrapped the Fokker, said no, no we're not gonna use this one now. So the Fokker was kind of an orphan until Guest bought her. Now an aviation enthusiast, but not a pilot, Guest arranged a crew for the journey on which she would essentially be a passenger. But when her aristocratic family on both sides of the Atlantic heard about her plans, they were shocked and they forbade her from going, though they had no objection to her organizing the trip. Meanwhile, Putnam, who had quickly acted on his insider information, contacted Guest and was already drumming up publicity for the historic trip, which now all of a sudden lacked a female pilot. So Putnam kind of jumped the gun, got a hold of information, started talking it up right away so he could corner the market on this story. This is the sort of guy he was. Um, so suddenly, I found myself entrusted with an odd chore, Putnam recalled in his autobiography. I was to find a suitable American woman who wanted to fly the Atlantic. Now, suitable, or a girl with the right image, as Guest herself put it, these are the operative words here. It may surprise you to know that at the time, there was a small but growing roster of women aviators from which to choose. There was young Ruth Roland Nichols, who was dubbed the flying debutante because of her social position, as she was the daughter of a Wall Street tycoon. And during the early 30s, she actually beat Lindbergh's uh, cross-country flight time at 13 hours and 21 minutes, and set other uh, speed records, distance record, altitude records, that remain unmatched today, even uh, among women pilots. There was also Bessie Coleman. She was the daughter of Texas sharecroppers, and she became the first African-American uh, woman to hold a pilot's license. And she had to earn that pilot's license in France in 1921, because no US flight school would admit her because of her race. There was also Ruth Elder, uh, AKA the Miss America of aviation. Uh, in 1927, she took off from New York in the airplane American Girl with a male co-pilot in an attempt to become the first woman to duplicate Lindbergh's transatlantic flight. 
They had a ditch about 360 miles from land or near the Azores, but it was at the time the longest flight ever made by a woman. There was also actress and socialite Mabel Ball, who was another possibility, although her qualifications, rather like Mrs. Guest's, extended little beyond the ability to pay a man to take her up in an airplane. Ultimately, neither of these women uh, passed Mrs. Guest's image stink test, if you will. Um, Elder's fallback career as a vaudeville performer put her out of the running. It was a little too distasteful. She was on the stage, of all things. And um, Ball's blonde bombshell brassiness and claims to gentility put her out of the running. She, had, she, she, she passed herself off as a, as a socialite, but she was actually the daughter of a bartender from Rochester. Um, but she, did, but she, she did a good job of it, though. She did all right for a while there. Um, now, another candidate was young Eleanor Smith, who during her first airplane ride at age six had to have her braids tied back to keep them from slapping in her face. She went on to become the youngest licensed pilot in the world at the age of 16. Her license, issued in 1927, was signed by none other than Orville Wright himself. A year later, she made headlines by flying a plane along the East River underneath the spans of the Queensboro, Williamsburg, Manhattan, and Brooklyn bridges consecutively. A feat that even her, you know, her brainstorming, or excuse me, barnstorming male counterparts were too nervous to attempt. The Devil May Care stunt earned her the nickname the Flying Flapper, together with a stern letter of reprimand from the US Department of Commerce. Commerce regulated the bridges. So, so she gets a, a letter from them you know, warning her, don't ever do this again. This is a contravention of the law, um, et cetera, et cetera. But enclosed with the letter was a little handwritten note from the clerk asking for her autograph. <laughs> Well, as you might have already guessed, the girl who finally ended up having all the right stuff, as it were, was young Amelia Earhart. She was born in Atchison, Kansas in 1897 to a comfortably middle-class family and learned to fly at the age of 23 in Long Beach, California. Recalling the first time that she went up in a plane, she wrote, by the time I had got two or 300 feet off the ground, I knew I had to fly. But just like today, flying wasn't cheap, and, and Earhart had to do something uh, to keep, you know, to subsidize her passion for flying. She'd been a nurse's aide during World War I and parlayed those skills into social work by 1928, the year Putnam was scouting around for a suitable woman to pilot for Mrs. Guest's uh, flight across the Atlantic. Earhart was working in Boston as a social worker at a place called Denison House which was an early settlement house providing food and shelter for immigrants and immigrant children until they could get out on their own. So refugees and immigrants coming in uh, would be processed and then they'd kind of seek temporary residence in a place like this until they could get out and get into a neighborhood and get work, et cetera, et cetera. So Earhart was uh, outside, busy with a handful of kids, as you can see here, and it's, it's, this is Earhart in the car surrounded by all these immigrant kids. Um, she was outside, you know, busy with these kids when the house phone rang. Tell them I'm busy was the first thing that she said when, uh, when she was called to the phone. And the guy who was calling her on the phone was Putnam's PR friend up there in Boston. Well, her next reaction, she finally, she finally took, took the call, and her next reaction uh, when she was asked if she would be interested in doing something aeronautic and dangerous was that she thought that she was being asked to go on a bootleg run. But it finally became clear that she was being offered the chance to be the first woman to fly uh, across the Atlantic. Her interest is peaked. So a meeting was scheduled in New York with Putnam. Now the meeting did not go well at first. Uh, Putnam kept her waiting outside his office for an hour, and when she, when she was finally ushered into his presence, she was sore as a wet hen, as Putnam recalled. Earhart herself said, I didn't like him. Uh, she found him brusque and rude, and he was taking one phone call after another during their interview. Yet by the end of the meeting, 
She recognized the, his tremendous power of accomplishments and immediately respected his judgment. Those are her words, uh, as she later told an interviewer. For his part, Putnam's brusqueness was actually um, an act. It was a poker face. He saw immediately that Earhart was not only the right woman for the job, but a potential gold mine of publicity with her slender frame and her, her golden brown bobs and her freckled face good looks. He also noted her vague resemblance to Lindbergh and reputedly coined the name Lucky Lindy, which she actually hated, and flooded the media with carefully orchestrated publicity shots of her in a masculine flying outfit. So this is all Putnam's idea, this, this clothing that she wore. The historic flight left Newfoundland on June 17th and touched down in Wales 20 hours and 40 minutes, excuse me, 49 minutes later. The next day, the flight crew went to Woolston near Southampton to refuel, where Earhart was greeted by Mrs. Foster Welch, who was the mayor of, uh, excuse me, uh, the mayor of uh, Southampton. Well, back in New York, she was given a ticker tape parade, though privately, she compared her role as a passenger to that of a sack of potatoes. Um, because she didn't do anything. I mean, she, she, was, she kept the flight log. That's all she did. She sat, there were two male pilot, pilot and co-pilot, and she was essentially a passenger. But she was the first woman to fly in a plane across the, across the Atlantic. So nonetheless, as Putnam hoped, the flight made her world famous. Now, Putnam invited her to stay with him and his wife, Dorothy Binney Putnam. She was a Bin, Dorothy Binney on the left here was the uh, Crayola Crown heiress um, at their home there in Rye, New York. And she, he invited her there so she could write up her story of her transatlantic flight. Now Putnam and his secretary actually wrote most of the book, um, which he titled 20 hours and 40 minutes as opposed to the 49 minutes. He shaved nine minutes off the, off the time because he thought it sounded snappier. Um, it was around this time that Earhart and Putnam probably began having an affair, uh, right under the nose of Dorothy, who Earhart considered a close friend. Although Dorothy really wasn't any saint herself, she was having an affair with her kid's tutor, a Yale student. Um, so everybody was in bed with everybody else, everybody had blood on their hands in this house, so. Um, in any event, I mean, uh, the, the, the end of the Putnam-Dorothy Binney marriage was rather undramatic. Uh, the, Putnam was out on the back having a barbecue, and Dorothy simply packed her bags, left. She bumped into a guest, actually, on the way down who recalled uh, that Putnam was out on the back of the patio gaily spearing, spearing hot dogs for a shy young aviatrix named Amelia Earhart. Uh, Dorothy soon filed for divorce on the pro forma grounds of failure to provide which is something of an irony since she was probably a heck of a lot richer than Putnam was, um, being the Crayola crown heiress. Earhart herself had been engaged since 1923 to chemical engineer Sam Chapman, a fellow her mother fixed her up with when she was younger. Earhart kept putting off the wedding and declined to wear an engagement ring because she knew that Chapman would effectively ground her once they were married. Perhaps she envisioned long, quiet nights sitting on the parlor there with Chapman while he puffed on his pipe and asked her to fetch him his slippers, maybe help him out of those cumbersome boots there. But uh, um, obviously, this was not the life that she envisioned for herself. So she broke off her engagement to Chapman prior to, prior to moving in with the Putnams. Questioned by reporters about future matrimonial plans, Earhart coyly responded, you never can tell. If I was sure of the man, I might get married tomorrow. Yet writing to a friend, she confided, I'm still unsold on marriage. I may not ever be able to see it except as a cage until I am unfit to work or to fly or to be active. Well, true to her word, Earhart devoted her energies to aviation over the next few years. She became the first woman to fly solo across the continental US and back. She set new altitude records and gave lectures promoting flying in general and women pilots in particular. And meanwhile, her picture appeared on the covers and in the pages of the most popular magazines of the day, like McCall's and Cosmopolitan and Red Book, et cetera. 
Uh, and it was an image that was meticulously crafted by Putnam. Your hats, they're a public nuisance, he wrote her. You should do something about them if you must wear them at all. He also coached her on how to smile for the camera, advising her how to uh, keep uh, the gap in her front teeth concealed. She had a, a gap in her, right between the two front teeth. But we told her when she smiled, don't, don't show your teeth. Keep your mouth closed. Keep your lips closed. Um, and he taught her how to walk during presentations, how to talk, where to stand, you know, how, to, how to turn and point at things. He, he, he just created her, really. Um, and I think this is a very telling photograph, actually. I mean, it's almost like Dr. Frankenstein, if you will, looking down on his, on, on his creation, although she's a lot more attractive than Boris Karloff. I'll give you that. So. And it was all paying off. Um, Earhart was earning hundreds and even thousands a week from all these endorsements and articles and lecture fees, and Putnam was, you know, taking a percentage of it all. Putnam also made sure that she was always front and center whenever the cameras were around, and that they were always focused on Amelia, even if she didn't quite deserve all the credit. Now that they were flying around the country making appearances, they had an entourage, a fairly large entourage, and they needed a bigger plane. But Earhart couldn't handle anything bigger than a two-seater. So Putnam uh, had a male pilot fly the plane, and when they landed, he had Amelia pop out like she'd just flown the aircraft. The pilot was sworn to secrecy not to tell anyone, but Earhart's fellow female pilots, like Eleanor Smith, were aware of her limitations. Smith was actually scared to death to go up in a plane with Earhart. Um, she's described uh, going up where there was, you know, wobbling the plane all over the sky. Um, and at, at one point, Putnam actually approached Smith with the offer to pay her $75 a week, which was a pretty good sum back then, to pilot an aircraft for Earhart during a cross-country women's air derby, telling her that, quote, of course, it must appeal that, um, appear that Amelia is doing it. Even though, uh, he even, excuse me, he even told Smith that when they landed and got out of the plane to stand by one side so that Amelia's name would come up first in the photo captions. When Smith refused, Putnam blew his top and threw her out of the office saying, you know, you'll never fly professionally again. While Putnam worked tirelessly to solidify Earhart's position as uh, America's foremost woman aviator to the exclusion of all others, he was just as determined to make the notoriously marriage-averse Earhart his wife. By his own account, she rejected at least two of his proposals. Other sources list as many as five. According to Earhart biographer Jean L. Backus, Earhart finally agreed to number six, in October of 1930. The setting, if not exactly romantic, was appropriate, the Lockheed Aircraft Factory in Burbank, California. Earhart didn't want any publicity about the engagement, and for once in his life, Putnam kept his mouth shut. He was possibly fearing that if the news leaked, Earhart might call the whole thing off, change your mind, get cold feet. He did, however, invoke one sacred privilege familiar to many a newly engaged man, and that is taking his girl home to meet mom. Widowed at 58, Francis Putnam uh, was looking for a quiet, out of the way place to live after the death of her husband. Some place removed from the New York scene, yet at the same time within easy reach of it. Acting on the advice of Catherine Speedy Forrest, who was a friend and a local artist with New York connections, Francis purchased a boxy Italianate summer home known as the Square House on Church Street in Noank in May of 1930. Quietly slipping in and out of Noank, Putnam and Earhart visited Francis periodically that year without causing too much fuss among the locals. On one such visit on November 8, 1930, Earhart and Putnam applied for a marriage license at the Groton Town Hall. The document, still on record at the town clerk's office, was signed by probate judge Arthur Anderson, who waived the five-day waiting period of intention required by state law 
and decreed that the intended marriage be celebrated right away. Putnam probably convinced him to do this. Putnam probably said, before she'll change her mind again. Either out of ignorance or nervousness, the clerk misspelled Earhart's name on the decree, which was later corrected, and left out the first A in her name. But Earhart, who thought nothing of climbing to record altitudes in open cockpit airplanes, froze at the idea of finally getting married. She said she needed more time to think about it, but that didn't top, excuse me, stop the town clerk, Henry Bailey, or Judge Anderson from spilling the beans to reporters who jumped all over the story. And it was out in the newspaper the next day. But Earhart's friends and relatives knew better and were not entirely pleased. Earhart's mother objected to the match because of their age difference. Putnam was about 10 years older than Amelia. And she also objected to the fact that Putnam was divorced, which is an irony since Earhart's mother herself was divorced. But um, also Putnam's ex-wife uh, was none too keen on it, or she looked upon it uh, somewhat mockingly. She predicted, they'll fight like cats and dogs in a year. She's stubborn and cold-bloodedly cruel, and she'll soon tire of his indigestion and rotten, vile temper. Well, <laughs> many happy returns of the day. <laughs> so, Many of Earhart's fellow women pilots similarly had few kind words for Putnam. Jacqueline Cochran, who was the first woman to break the sound barrier, described him as the dullest person I've ever been around, while Eleanor Smith informed Earhart over lunch that she'd just as soon see her marry Genghis Khan. <laughs> to be fair, many of these people had axes to grind. Um, certainly Putnam's ex-wife was not one of their couple's biggest fans, while Cochran and Smith were threats to Putnam's plans to make Earhart the most famous female aviator in history, to the exclusion of all others. Yet Cochrane admitted that Earhart did have genuine affection for Putnam. She was nuts about him, she later recalled. Her face would light up when he'd telephone, or the way she'd look at him. So there was, there was something there, something going on there. Well, the day finally came on February 6, 1931. Putnam telephoned his mother to tell her that he and Earhart would be driving up that night from New York to be wed there at the house the following day. Putnam also put in a call to Judge Anderson, asking him to perform the ceremony. The next day was clear and cold. There were no guests, just Putnam's mother and two witnesses, Putnam's uncle and Judge Anderson's son, Robert, a future judge himself and a 24-year-old lawyer at the time. There wasn't time to arrange flowers or decorate the house or not even buy a wedding ring. Putnam's mother supplied the ring, was a platinum substitute, suggesting that Putnam was striking while the iron was hot. But Earhart had a few conditions. Just before the judge arrived, she handed Putnam a two-page, double-sided letter spelling out the terms of what today would be considered a prenup. Brutal in its frankness, as Putnam later wrote, but beautiful in its honesty. There seem to be, there, excuse me, there are some things which should be writ before we are married, it began. You must know again my reluctance to marry, my feeling that I shatter thereby chances in work which mean most to me. I want you to understand, I shall not hold you to any medieval code of faithfulness to me, nor shall I consider myself bound to you similarly. Please let us not interfere with the other's work or play, and I will try to do my best in every way and give you that part of me you know and seem to want. Well, Earhart was sitting on the uh, sofa, engaged in a discussion about aviation with the young Anderson, when it was time for the five-minute civil ceremony in which Earhart had the word obey stricken from the vows. <laughs> when it was all over, Putnam's mother placed a string of amber beads around her new daughter-in-law's daughter neck, who promptly returned to the sofa to pick up her conversation. As he was leaving, Judge Anderson congratulated the bride, addressing her as Mrs. Putnam. And she responded, please, sir, I prefer, I prefer Miss Earhart. And the judge bristled and turned on his heels and walked away. Putnam put in a call to his secretary to let her know she could release the news. Then he and Earhart skipped town, leaving Putnam's mother and other locals to deal with the press. In the absence of many details, the media, just like today, uh, just made them up. 
The New York Times reported that the ceremony took place before a crackling fire in the classic New England home overlooking Long Island Sound. Well, the home didn't have a fireplace, and uh, there wasn't any, any adequate view of the sound, uh, at least not from the first floor. And the Whoppers continued to grow. Uh, even to this day, locals like to tell the story of a local real estate agent who tried to start the rumor that Earhart's wedding reception, which never took place, uh, was held in a somewhat grander mansion just down the street. Uh, no anchors also chuckle with movie depictions of Putnam and Earhart, like this one from a, a 2009 film with Richard Gere as Putnam and Hilary Swank as Earhart, taking long walks down Noank's famous sandy beaches, which, <laughs> which if you're from Noank, I'm sure you know the long walk involves a walk of about 20 seconds if you're lucky. On any, there aren't really any sandy beaches, of course. So. Well, a year after her marriage, Earhart made her own solo flight across the Atlantic, and in 1936 began planning a round-the-world trip for the following year. On June 1st, she and navigator Fred Noonan set off from Miami and on July 2nd disappeared during the final leg of the journey somewhere over the Pacific while searching for Howland Island. The role of Noonan in the flight is the final piece of the puzzle behind the Noank plaque. Noonan was an experienced celestial navigator, skills which Earhart lacked, which is why she needed him on the flight. Flying over great expanses of ocean is different than flying over land, where pilots can visually pick a spot on the horizon and, just, and head for it. Howland Island was just this tiny speck in the middle of nowhere, and they needed precise measurements to find it. So it's possible that cloud cover or some other weather factor likely contributed to a miscalculation on, on Newton's part and ultimate crash. If they were off by, you know, a half a degree or what have you, uh, they would, would have flown right by it, which is probably what they did. Now, at least that's what many historians have suggested. Earhart's last radio signal was at 8.43 a.m., July 2, 1937. The Navy and Coast Guard searched for the plane for nearly three weeks before calling it off. Putnam himself financed an extended search by hiring local boats, but of course no one ever found anything, though the speculations, wild speculations, began early. Uh, you know, she was, well, she'd forced down, she was captured by the Japanese, there was all kinds of things that were rumors that were, that were going on. In June of 2010, in order to honor both Earhart and Noonan, NAVLIST, an international group of celestial navigation enthusiasts, dedicated the plaque in Noank as part of Celestial Navigation Weekend at the Mystic Seaport that year. Because of its central location, and out of respect for the privacy of the current owner of the house, where Earhart and Putnam were married, the Historical Society chose to hang the plaque on the Latham Chester store instead of on the actual house. Considering Earhart's desire to keep her private life private, and the fact that this five-minute episode in her life seemed far less significant to her anyway than the many hours she spent aloft, I think the decision uh, may be just what, what she would have wanted in this case. Doesn't the uh, Noank Historical Society have quite a bit of material on her? Oh, they absolutely do. The Noank Historical Society, by the way, if you don't already know, is a great little institution. Very helpful, terrific place to visit, um, and just a, a, a gold mine of information. Um, and they do have a terrific uh, folder on, on this, and if, if, you, if you're nice and your hands are clean, uh, they might let you go in and dip into it and look through it. I, I'm not sure, but they, they did allow me to go in and, and look through it. I, th I think anybody can come in. I, I think that gets requested now and then. Um, but yes, they, do, they probably have more information than anybody. They have a, a pretty good file, which includes a lot of old uh, newspaper articles um, as well as photographs. The photograph that you saw of Frances, uh, Putnam's mother, and Amelia is the only photograph taken of, of the two of them in Noank, and that's, that's there at the Historical Society.
Was no trace ever found of her or of the other, other Well, that's the big question. Was any trace ever found of Amelia Earhart? You know, it seems like every few years another little piece of her surfaces somewhere. Um, to the best of my knowledge, nobody's ever definitively found any trace of, of her plane or her remains. Uh, yeah, I mean, the most recent article that I saw was, it was uh, maybe a couple of years ago now, uh, looking at some old photographs that were taken in this area. I don't know what it was near Howland Island, uh, but it was in the in the area, and um, somebody thought they might have detected a, a prop of an airplane sticking up out of the water. But uh, you know, I, I'm sure that she and Noonan died a quick death, um, went down in the water, and um, no, she's at the bottom of the sea. Well. That's it. Thank you for coming.